um, yeah, we was going to say we'll keep it relatively informal. It's just going to be kind of like a chat, and we'll we'll go through a few things that I've got listed, a bit of about the book, and a bit of uh, some current current affairs stuff. Um, sure. Absolutely. But sure. uh, by way of intro, because our, the, our, the readers of our website, they'll probably know you from the big oil and, and uh, their bankers in the Persian Gulf, but they probably yeah. won't know much about your history prior to that. And I've, yeah. I've read that you've done a lot of traveling and you've actually been to a lot of these countries that are affected by the sort of you know globalism, globalization and stuff. So can you give us a little bit of introduction about yourself and how you got involved in all of this first? Yeah, man. Um, well, I mean... I guess, you know, I grew up on a farm in South Dakota, a big cattle ranch, really, and, uh, you know, my old man died in a car wreck when I was 12, and that kind of changed my whole life. We moved to town and uh, went to college, and uh, it was kind of a, just a pretty, like a jock farm kid, you know, pretty sheltered from the, you know, it was like a little town of a thousand people in the middle of nowhere, mm-hmm. but it's a good upbringing, uh, too, you know, I got good values instilled uh, in me, I think. And then, I don't know, just um, went to college and uh, things started just not to add up in the real world or the big world. Or, uh, so I got, you know, started taking more political science classes and uh, Native American studies uh, classes. Studied a lot about the Lakota, that's the people where I'm from, anthropology and sociology. And, and you know, you get some radical professors yeah. uh, that start to clear some things up. Uh, at least I did. And was lucky. And um, then I just said, I got to go see it. So I went to Nicaragua back in, um, I think it was 1985, with this Witness for Peace organization that was, you know, trying to stop the Contra War that Reagan had okay. launched, you know, against this the, the Sandinistas. Sandinistas. Yeah. Yeah, the revolutionaries. And um, so that was pretty eye opening. And then um, I, I got a, I guess I was traveling around the world at the travel bug. I've had the travel bug. I still have the travel bug. Um, and uh, I applied for this uh, Erasmus scholarship at University of Montana. Got that. It was a full ride to get my master's degree. And my liberal, my, my bachelor's was in the Bachelor of Liberal Studies, it was called, which is very interdisciplinary. So it allowed you to take all those courses that I was talking about. Yeah. And just kind of explain why you thought it was more important to have a well rounded education than it was to just lock into like one subject, you know, which they try to get people to do. And I think is, is I think it is a real important thing for kids to do. Yeah, absolutely. Go to college and just in life in general, just get a well rounded education, right? So anyway, um, applied for that while I was traveling over to India and stuff and around the world for about eight months. Got it. Um, went to Missoula, Montana. That's right when the Gulf War was breaking out in uh, 1990. And so we ended up, I think, having the biggest per capita protests in the U.S., according to Nation Magazine, was Missoula, Montana. You know, we had wow. over half the people in the streets. I ran an alternative newspaper called the Missoula Paper, and it was one of those real scribbly kind of cut and paste. They called them zines, you know. Yeah. And I think I, I think we were kind of one of the pioneers in that thing, maybe. And um, got on the FBI and he list, of course. And I was already on there. I mean, Ed Riddler is the editor. And I know because my friend in the Air Force, injured, he went to the Air Force training in San Antonio at Lackland Air Force Base, and the first thing that happened was they pulled out a dossier about me. And asked him, do you know this guy? You know, <laughs> this was before any of this. So they're, they're so, vetting him, but asking about him about you. What's that? They, they were vetting yeah, him about me. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I me. You know, and so um, anyway, we, we we really were uh, getting into that whole war thing in the Gulf and what's going on, and so started. You know, I was doing a, a, a master's, and I decided to do my thesis on. Um, well, it was a really long title. It's called the Gulf Cooperation Council, a regional resource security regime. I'm sorry, regional resource security state for the regime of international capital accumulation. You know, one of those real intellectual <laughs> big names things. That is but that does kind of title. describe it. And mm-hmm. It's just how they use the Persian Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, to as basically the uh, colonial uh in a neo-colonial sort of setup where they just extract the oil from that area, which is 42% of the world's oil is on the south yeah. um, west side of that Persian Gulf. You probably caught that reading my book. Yeah. It's a very important number because that's why they had to put those kings in there with no voting at you all. Know, and they guard these guys with British special forces, retired people who are yeah. actually better than them 
uh, I six, you know, they're the best, they're the best paid. That's why they get paid better by, you know, the house of sound that, yeah. that the I six could ever pay them. And so James Bond types, and, um, it's all set up that way. And so then they had to keep Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Algeria, uh, Libya, all the radicalized, uh, Arab states who weren't part of that scheme, but who actually had elections and democracies. That's the ones we call, you know, despots and dictators when mm-hmm. they actually have elections. You know, we call it the ones that don't are friends, uh, sadly. Um, and, uh, we, but that's changing now. That's a very significant development right now, now after the Kurdistan, uh, taken over by the Iraqi forces the other day. I think things are really shifting. But anyway, that's what, uh, you know, that's what the thesis was about. And so what I did is I, I went traveling again, <laughs> what he did, and I set it aside as a stack and it was my thesis and whatever. And then I kept adding articles from the Bangkok Post or the, you know, San Jose Costa Rica newspaper, Tico Times, whatever, um, Honduras newspapers, you know, and, and I can read a little Spanish, understand some of that. So get the gist of it. And, um, Reading books, I probably read over 100 books after I got my thesis, and most of those were to do with the conspiracy aspects, the Charlotte Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, of Rothschilds, uh, all that, the federal, you know, central banks, and all that stuff, yeah. CIA drug trafficking, all that stuff. And so, what I kind of did with my thesis, I took it and I, I took my thesis, I put it down, and I kind of interspersed in each chapter, there's 20 chapters. Um, part of it's my thesis, part of it is a conspiracy angle on that story I just told in my thesis and you know how that's relevant so if you look at the book it's kind of cool that way it's like yeah. each chapter is mixed up a little bit that way but it's all uh, 936 footnotes or something so it's, well, it's, it's not really conspiracy, well it's yes. conspiracy facts yes and uh, it's it's damning and it's i'll go to i've never been sued although one saudi prince threatened to because he claimed he wasn't part of this other thing he was an irrelevant character so i I, I went ahead and deleted that, uh, but what it did is it got Amazon straightened out because Amazon was ripping me off of my books as well as our previous publisher. So this king and this you know hotshot London lawyer actually went after Amazon, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> and they <laughs> saw my books cut rate right, and old copy, Thank so you. it worked for me. But uh, I'll stand behind it. I have, and, and nobody sued me, and so you know it's all true, and so it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean it's, it's it is a damning indictment of of the system that's been going on for centuries now. And it all goes back to the old uh, banking families in England and the Johnny Mathesons, opium wars with China, taking exporting opium out of India. Uh, you know, yeah. our prized possession in the UK that was our colonial goal. You know, um, yeah. uh, Suez Canal was all was all geared up for the same thing. Um, so all along, it's all been about um, drugs, arms, weapons, money, banking. They're so interrelated, and the book. Is I think the only one on the market that you can actually picture it all and, and join all the dots. Um, well, thank you. That's a big compliment. I don't know. I hope so. That's what I aim to do. Definitely connect dots and uh, connect the Kennedy assassination to the Lockerbie bombing. You know, connect uh, the Libyan, uh, you know, terror, you know, so-called terrorism with you know sponsored ISIS and CIA terrorism. But it all kind of goes. There's two. Um, you probably noticed that, yeah, but there's two. I think there's two general themes of the book, and one is that everything emanates from the city of London. Yes. I mean that's the true power structure yeah. on this planet, and you know people think the U.S. or people think Wall Street, kind of junior partners, you know, as it mm. turns out, and um, Israel is a direct creation and servant of the city of London. I mean, yeah. every time Israel does something to the Palestinians, it's really the London bankers doing it. And so, and every time the U.S. gets picks a fight or goes at North Korea or goes at somebody else, it's the London bankers putting us up to it, mm-hmm. putting some puppet like Trump or Clinton in there, or Obama or who you know, some puppet like Theresa May, you know, puppets, yeah. you know, whoever in there to do that. But that's what the goal goal is. And they, they that, you know, British intelligence is James Bond. It's just real slick, so they hide behind it all. See, and they they create levels of deniability. You know, like they fund the Aga Khan Institute in Pakistan. That's the big one. That's the Al Qaeda incubator. And Aga Khan is a rich uh, resource owner in the south of France. And it actually lives near the Rothschilds estate, probably France. But they tout it as this development agency, Aga Khan Foundation. It's actually a terrorist incubator. And it's owned officially by a Crown Corporation, which is very interesting. Okay. The Crown Corporation. Wow. So it all comes yeah, back to London. That's, yeah, that level. And so they're literally cranking out Al-Qaeda, ISIS, 
El Shabaab, uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, uh, all these terrorists, every single act of terrorism on this planet is a false flag by mm. basically by British intelligence. Yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah. We, we, we so follow that, um, a UK-based historian called Mark Curtis. I don't know if you've ever seen heard of this guy. He's written quite, yeah, quite a few books. I, and, and he gets, I mean, I don't agree with him any, on, lo on lots of things, but he gets his information from the horse's <laughs> mouth, effectively. So he will go down to the National Archives and look at declassified files. And these are all written by Foreign Office planning departments. And they never, you can tell the way they write, they never expect any scrutiny of these files. They're normally buried and, and classified for maybe 30, 40 years. He gets them as soon as they're declassified. And obviously there's never a mention of human rights or uh, humanitarian intervention, unless it's for PR purposes or propaganda purposes. But what there is, is just a long, sordid history of collusion with radical Islam. Uh, and if you go yeah. back long enough, he goes back to, you know, we were funding Ibn Saud before the kingdom had even been created, during the Ottoman Empire. Um, yeah. and, and I guess before that, and, and, and obviously the, the, the London connection, the city of London connection, uh, this is where Nathan Rothschild made his money. That was the London branch of the family. And um, people yeah. say he did his, his little insider trading scam after the Battle of Waterloo and pretty uh, much took control of everything then. Yeah, um, that's when he did it. Yeah, bet on both sides. Bet on Napoleon. Bet on. Well, he knew ball. he knew that Napoleon had lost the battle, um, yeah. but but yeah. feigned it and it made out that he, that Napoleon had won, and that caused panic across across the stock market. Yeah. He was then yeah. seen to be selling stuff later on in the day. He was secretly buying it up for pennies on the pound or pennies yeah. on the dollar, and so yeah. that's how they made their money. I think initially, obviously, they were. Fairly wealthy goldsmiths from their time in Frankfurt, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so some, yeah. Some people say that even before that, they they basically robbed the House of Hess because the Rothschild started as the Bauer family. That's e right. U E R, and they worked for the House of Hess, which was the German monarchy, the king and the queen of Germany. And they say they actually ripped off a lot of money from them while they were their kind of their Hofjuden, you know, their servants. Yeah. It's, call them half Jude back then it was like well, these Jews who would serve the oligarchy and be sort of there just just below them you know and still today you have people like the Bronfmans who kind of serve that role in Canada Zionists and, mm. and they're just Montefiore family is another one uh, that does that it's interesting but um it's nothing to do with Jewish people it's just a class of people who you know they want power there's Jews there's Catholics in there there's Protestants, and you know, there's a lot of Satanists in there, frankly. Yeah. Most of them are Satanists. Most of them are neo-Darwinian Satanists who justify everything by this kind of survival of the fittest crap, um, which is a total lie. And so it, it's just a mixed bag, but that is true, that, that, that these uh, these Hoff Judah did serve that role. It's just a historical fact. And they still, interestingly, kind of do because, you know, again, you have the crowns, the, the House of Windsor, the House of Hess, the House, House Hess, of course, is broken up now. Um, that's the von Turn and Taxis family in Germany. That yeah. you know they're very powerful still, but they're broken up officially. But all, uh, are being served by these Sephardic Jews that basically during the Inquisition in Spain got kicked out of Spain, and also the Moors helped kick them out. Then they went over to the Caribbean and started the slave trade, <laughs> you know, in Brazil and um, all through the Caribbean. And you know, they, so they're just not nice people, whoever they are, whatever they claim to be their religion and. So yeah, it's the city of London, and, and it's that mix, that intermarriage of uh, Hofjuden bankers like the Rothschilds, the Kuhnrobes, the you know, yeah. Goldman Sachs. There's not that many these, families, is there, really, in reality? Yeah, there's, there's, there's not, not many few. families. Got, you know, John Coleman wrote The Committee of 300, and that's an excellent book. You may have read that. Yeah. Ex-British Ex Intelligence, yeah. uh, MI6 officer. And that's definitely one of the seminal books on this, and just how tightly it actually is. How, that's what blows people's mind, and that's why they... A lot of reasons they just can't get their heads around this, you know, but more and more people are getting their heads around it. Right. And uh, the other reason people can't get their heads around it is because they're so evil that you know people want to believe human nature is good, and I think it is good. But uh, generally, I think ninety nine point nine nine percent of people at least mean to do well. They'll hope. I don't know. At some at some level, I think that might be changing because of computers and the internet and yeah. sort of dehumanization of people. Even though we're doing this here, you know, it's just not a healthy general trend. I'm thinking, but anyway. They just can't, they can't, it's what's hard for them to imagine that there's this little, small, minutia of a percentage of people who are just pure evil and just really have your worst interest in mind. That's just, that's why they live, that's why they exist. They want to just exploit you, bury you, be on top all the time. And they're psychopaths. I mean, they're, they're sociopaths and psychopaths um, in, in every definition of the term. 
Um, but they've accumulated all this dough and they own all our central banks and they own the drugs and the guns and the oil. And, um, and so, you know, I guess and that's hopefully the other message of the book is how, yeah, they, they, not only did they get in bed with radical Islam and, and specifically Islamism, because, you know, there's a lot of, you got to be very specific when you're talking about these things because people want to hate Muslims too nowadays, which is stupid, mm. <laughs> which hopefully is another message of the book. There's two branches of, of, uh, the Muslim world and some of them are fighting, some of them are freedom fighters, they're on our side, you know, Mike, they're on yeah. you know, the awareness side, you know, like Gaddafi and like Assad in Syria. That's and, the sort of Arab Assad. nationalist kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and decades of Iraqi communist rule, you know, and, and then Iranian revolution that has straightened out and not become as much about the mullahs as it is yeah. about leftist nationalist policy nowadays. You know, so there's that. So hopefully, it, it's got. To, we got to tell a story about the Islamists. We're, not only were cavorting with the CRB and you, they were created by these people. In fact, mm. because Wahhabism was created by British intelligence, it was actually introduced into the into Saudi Arabia by British intelligence, and that's a fact too. And it's it's amazing. And I don't even think that's in my book. I found that out later. Yeah, and I probably add it, but it's very important um, because they have promoted this dumbed down. And if you think about it, and I write this in my book, it's congruent with monopoly capitalism. This sort of, you know, Taliban, intolerant, you know, oppress women, keep people stupid, ban everything, yeah. take away all rights. I mean, it's just congruent with what McDonald's and Burger King are doing to us over here. You know, it's the yeah. same shit. <laughs> it's exactly the right? same. Yeah. So, I mean, it, why not be yeah. bedfellows? Why not both go to war against nationalist Arabs, you know, communist socialist Arabs who want to take their resources back from these international conglomerates and their bankers and their families that own these banks, which ultimately is eight and a few more. They call this the uh, the threat of a good example, don't they? Um, yeah. I've heard that, I've heard that yeah. in, in foreign office planning documents, seen it written, the threat of a good example in Nicaragua, the threat of a good example yeah. in Panama and El Salvador. And, and, and right. when I talk to people about this, they go, how can these countries be seen as a good example? Well, the reason is... They had really modest kind of land reforms. They had a president that yeah. was elected and then went on to do what he was elected to do, what he promised to do. You know, yeah. we, we don't like that in the West. You know, yeah, we land, them, yeah, we land land reform. I'm and, glad you brought that up because that's so important. Uh, we need land reform in America. You probably need land reform. Absolutely, right? yeah. never going to happen, right? No. But I mean, that's a, that they don't like that because that actually empowers people instead of being on food stamps, being on the dole, you know, shooting up heroin in there. 10 story hobble that the government gave them, you actually give these people some land and they're like, that's different. Okay. Yeah. When you own land, when you can grow your own food, when you can cut your own wood, when you can raise a few chickens and you have some to protect even from outsiders, yeah. it just brings you up a level and it's empowering. That's true empowerment, you know, and, and they don't like that. Yeah. But we need it. We need land reform big time. Well, our history books in the UK and certainly what we did at school when, of, of kind of like the middle ages in England. Uh, and it, it's just not, really talked about exactly what people were living on but they were living a fairly subsistence lifestyle but they were working the average man in sort of 1300 1400 was only working for about 14 weeks a year so that's like a yeah. quarter of the year the rest of the yeah. time they did volunteer work you know all the cathedrals around europe certainly in england yeah. they were all built with volunteer labor there was no slave labor building cathedrals so if these guys had time to not only build the cathedrals but all the people had time to do go on pilgrimage to these things. They weren't working fifty-two weeks a year like we all do today. You know, they had. Yeah. It might. It might be. It might look grim because they didn't have all of modern. You know, all the trinkets of modern society and all the shiny stuff. But they actually had time and they had land, and that was obviously all taken away from them during the Enclosure Act and things like that. And then all the yeah. common land that they used to use that was that had all disappeared, and that is now that's gone full circle now. So now we have. What appears in London and all cities around you, uh, around the UK, what appears to be public land is now private land, and it's public. Yeah. You, you think it's public because when you walk onto it, no one's stopping you. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no checkpoint. But if you go and do a protest on there, they'll come over and arrest you because it's yeah, private. Yeah. And there's, it, it's a really insidious kind of method of of taking what used to be ours, yeah. and now they now it's owned by the big banks and the corporations that, that yeah. are, you know built up around them. So. Yeah, it's yeah. um, it's That's right. it's hundreds of years of, of depra deprivation and, and effectively right. theft of what what was the commons. That's right, the commons. They stole the commons. At first, they stole our private land, each of ours. Because there was, geez, you know, like you say, three, even 300 years ago in America, I mean, that's why people came to America, because yeah. of those enclosure acts. And yeah. 
the tyranny of the king and queen, and they wanted to get out of there and come over here where they could do what they wanted. And so, you know, That's 300 years ago in this country, not even, it was like 2% of the people lived in cities and 98% lived on land in the country. Yeah. Now it's completely opposite and even worse to where 1.5% now live on their own land and 98.5% live in the cities in America. Right. In America. And and they, literally, what they did, Mike, you nailed it. They stole our land. Hmm. That, people say, "What what happened? How this?" They stole our land. That's what happened. Yeah. That's the root of it. That's the root of all of it. That's why land reform is so important yeah. because they stole our land. And then, yeah, they now they're stealing the commons. What they they threw us these crumbs, you know, after they stole our land and the farm crisis or the housing crisis or the whatever crisis that they fabricated, made money buying on the way up, made money selling stock on the way down. Bought it again at the bottom and ran it back up. And made another crash, and that's what these guys do. They mm -hmm. really are financial parasites, yeah. and they they seek to destroy wealth, not create wealth. Yeah. So, except in their own pocket, of course. Of course. But the public wealth doesn't matter. Just run them into debt. The more you get them into debt, the more you can control their policy. The more you can tell them to privatize some more stuff, sell them your public water system. Da 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 da. -da. So, um, anyway, the other thing about that book, yeah, I think it describes those two factions of Muslims. Uh, back to that, just. To, to, to kind of close that in a, in a way that people can understand like it's not it's not Muslims who are against this man Muslims are just Muslims Christians are just Christians it's this faction of Muslims created by our intelligence agencies that are wreaking all this havoc up until and including that election in Kenya uh, the other day where they again uh, interfered with it uh, with guys with machetes in the streets well paid mm. you know by the by Odinga and his uh, banker boys and it just happens every day, and people don't know it because the Western media doesn't report it every day, but it's happening every single day. It happened in South Sudan, it's happening in Niger, it's happening in, in Nigeria, it's happening now every day, and it's still happening. And they just permanent war, just keep making money, you know, is yeah. number one, and just number two, to just keep rolling back revolutions, because they're anti-revolutionary, these people, by yeah. nature. The monarchy uh, concept is by its own, by definition, it's anti-revolutionary. So that's why the king and queen and the queen Elizabeth and stuff, she hates America. She really loathes us. She loathes, the, you know, Canada and Australia. She loathes these things that have gotten a little bit away from them, mm -hmm. especially us because we fought the bastards. Yeah. I mean, we actually took arms up against them. And that is why they want to take guns in America. And I, by the way, even though I'm a leftist, I'm very pro-Second Amendment, and, and I like to everybody to have a gun, everybody to jump, maybe because I'm a leftist, actually, yeah. is the reality. But, you know, in the modern parlance, it's not doesn't connect because you, all these liberals are dumbed down on transgender BS and, you know, whatever. Well, it's uh, identity poli politics, which is another politics, yeah, fluff, rules. Agenda is different. Anyway, yeah. but, um, yeah, so, anyway, it, yeah, but the land thing's really important. I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, so just to finish that, you, I think you were talking about the, the Muslim faith and then the other branch, is the, which is not related at all, is, is political Islam. And, and that, that's, that's, that's the kind of dangerous Wahhabi, Salafi kind of style that, that we just use as proxy armies wherever we need them, whether it be uh, Bosnia, whether it be, you know, yeah. Chechnya, uh, Syria, them, Libya. Train them, arm them, yeah, create them too, though. And it's, of course, the most recent incarnation is uh, in Afghanistan, 1979, Jimmy Carter was president. And Zig Brzezinski was its secretary of state. And, and you know, they really created the Mujahideen mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. And out of that came the Bosnian Muslim army, yeah. those trained guys, right? Yeah. After they ran a bunch of smack for them yeah. and you know, all that and uh, and overthrew the Cheriki government, again, a left-wing well, left government, government in Afghanistan. Yeah. And then said the Soviets invaded. Yeah, that's rich because we had already assassinated their foreign minister and everything else. And then the Soviets came in. The Soviets didn't invade but Afghanistan. The, the Soviets were invited, weren't they? High. It's a total lie. The Soviets were invited, and, and Carter had already funded yeah, the Mujahideen before the Soviet came in. Yeah, that, they, they said, we got, <laughs> we got to have your help. I mean, they're going to overthrow this government. That's what they said to, to Leonid Brezhnev. And he and, and drop off his uh, KGB guy decided, you know, kind of convinced him that, yeah, we got to do this, because if we don't do this, um, the Americans are just going to turn this into a colony while they're trying to do it again. And, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't but, know an, another country that's been... So decimated over the last fifty years as Afghanistan, really, it's, it's, it's such it's, a shame. Um, and, and, and actually, during that time, during the sort of early eighties, mid eighties, um, Bin Laden actually had an office based in London, believe it or not. Yeah, and, and we yeah, were having these Mujahideen guys, and they were coming into the UK on tourist yeah, visas yeah. and going flying up to Scotland to train with SAS guys, and then going back battle hardened and 
knowing all about that's explosives true. and stuff like this. Uh, that's so, a nice little tidbit of information. Yeah, yeah, that, right. that, that's another yeah. Mark Curtis uh, from from one of his books, and 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 again, that that's in historical record now. That's from from the uh, National Archives. He got that. Nice, nice. Um, that's good. Well, it makes sense. That's all working together because you know, again, Bin Laden wasn't some rogue black sheep, you know. Of the Bin Laden family, he was real close with his dad, his brother Salman. His, his father Salman was a huge construction magnate, one of the um, thirteen wealthiest families in Saudi Arabia, and so was he. And he was basically a playboy. And um, you know, they they just get a profile. Basically, Al Qaeda, more than anything, it's like computer program, you know. And then they just kind of use Bin Laden for the visuals and stuff. And um, and the underlings are already trained, and they just of course feed them nothing but. BS, keep them in the dark, don't tell them anything, tell them they're fighting for jihad, they're going to go to heaven and, you know, they'll be they'll be in the best place and lie to them, just kind of like the evangelical Christians make up that lie about stuff over here mm. to get people to do stupid stuff and vote for their own people, but, um, but yeah, they, they were, they were invited in and, um, the Soviets and they had to come in and still it's the battle for Central Asia, that, that remains a very pivotal area. Zig Brzezinski wrote the book about it, the Grand Chessboard, and it includes, uh, you know, Tajikistan and uh, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and, and that whole area because they already in 98 when they did the fake uh, wall coming down thing, which is also all orchestrated and fake and created by the CIA and the Vatican mainly, the right wing Pope John Paul II, um, you know, they funded all the radio stations, they funded Lekwalesa Solidarity Movement. He was a big hero, right? Well, people don't realize the Solidarists were the ones that killed Kennedy. I mean, they're not heroes. They're like the white Russian mafia. They're like the super oligarchy, really rich. And they backed Walesa, and and he wasn't a a genuine labor leader at all. He was just this kind of stooge that the corporations put in as a labor leader. I mean, from what we saw at the time, there was a huge following. Obviously, all the dock workers were... We're thinking he was the savior, and yeah, you know, wrote to get dance and all that it. good stuff. And, you know that they, I'm sure their intentions were good, and I'm sure they're, on you know, a lot of them have. But he again, they could just manipulate these movements, and they did. And at the same time, of course, you had, uh, you know, just you know, they put in Yeltsin, you know, who was a total IMF stooge as president of Russia. He's the one that you know allowed their economy to be wrecked, and yeah, and. Pilford, you know, and, I mean, that, you know, the, the four oil, or what I call the four horsemen in the book, you know, Exxon Mobil, <laughs> Real that Shell, Chevron Texaco, BP Shell, um, I mean, Shell, uh, Shell Pennzoil, actually. Uh, they, they, they doubled their wealth. I mean, they doubled their assets by 50% during that, just when the wall came down, just by virtue of privatizing all that stuff in Kazakhstan, mm. all that stuff uh, in Azerbaijan. Which is the rich, which is the gold mine. I mean, that's BP mostly. They got that um, through Luke Oil, but they just stole a bunch of resources from the Russians. I mean, they stole it and privatized it and put it under their hands. And now, now Putin's come back and he's undone some of that stuff. And that's why they hate him so bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, yeah that's gone. That's gone out, out of control now. Russia yeah. Russiaphobia is is all over yeah. the media. Yeah, they get blamed for everything these yeah. days. Everything, yeah. Because um, they hate him because he's a, he's a leftist. He's decidedly leftist, nationalist individual. That's that's the reality. I mean, say what else you want, but if you're a political scientist, <laughs> you get that guy in the category of a leftist. Well, he he's certainly not, put he, he put paid to the unipolar world that that, that that existed, you know, for the last sort of ten, fifteen years, certainly. Um, you and you look at what what happened in uh, Syria. I mean, Ali and I just got back from Syria in April this year, and I was yeah. out there in September, and and we kind of knew what was going on. And this this all st- stemmed from when we set when we set up the the website. It, it was kind of around the Libya thing, and mm-hmm. we'd heard we had we friends that were in Libya at the time, and um, and they were saying yeah, there was like Qatari regulars that were out of uniform, and then there was lots of these. Guys that probably come from Afghanistan and places like that, they just brought them all in to do what what they needed to be done. Um, and and we did we did our very first interview with a guy called Don DeBar from the U.S. And we'd done a little bit of research on how uh, generous the Libyan welfare state was, and so they had free education up to university level and free uh-huh. healthcare and and so much other stuff. You know, there was uh, Don actually told me, and I didn't realize this was true, but he said that. Uh, no one in Libya had a mortgage, and no one had, yeah. uh, no one paid rent. So housing was seen as a right, 
which is ab absolutely amazing. Um, all the farm, yeah. the people that worked on farms, they didn't pay income tax or VAT and stuff like this. So it was amazingly generous, and there would have been yeah. no need for them to to have any kind of insurgency at all. So it, it all yeah. it all looked to me to be just this is this is not right. This is wrong. Something something other than what the media are telling us is happening here. So that's yeah. why we. You know, I'm not a journalist myself. Ali has written some stuff for the Guardian newspaper before, but sure. we we both knew that we wanted to do something. Um, so yeah. we, you know, start researching and and then start publishing and get our own place. Yeah. And and so Syria, the trip to Syria was literally an extension of that. We knew again, same mo in Damascus. Yeah. There was never a popular yeah. uprising. And and yeah. one of the things that we that we discovered out there, and this was just truly amazing to me, is. Obviously, they're really intelligent people. Again, free education, free healthcare, but they can discern the difference between British people or American people, because there was Americans in our group, and British and American governments. So there was absolutely no animosity to any of us in our group. And, and I, when I go to these countries, my first thing to do really is just hand on heart and apologise, you know, <laughs> for, for everything that's happened to, to, from from my government. And they get Mike. We understand that the British people are not the British government. We get it. You don't need to worry. There is no yeah. animosity here, and it's a beautiful yeah. secular country. You know, they they all identify as Syrians before they identify as Sunni or Shia or or Christian yeah. or Druze or Jews. You know, it was yeah. it was just so wonderful to be there and see exactly what's going on. To see that I think everyone that we spoke to, we actually met members of the opposition, what I'd call the official opposition, which is like those that aren't under arms. And, and even they supported their government during what they call the crisis, this current crisis. They they might be back into opposition once it's all over, but I mean, it's, it's looking like this is this is probably for the first time in a long time the West has lost its own battle. The proxy forces are, are kind of almost finished, and they're being decimated. There's a a few pockets in Idlib, and I think Deir ez has recently liberated. We're in Aleppo just four months after liberation. You just see the destruction that was caused there. Um, but the people are already in back back in their homes rebuilding. It's absolutely yeah. inspirational to see it. But yeah, it's, I know. Yeah, I know what you mean. It is inspirational. It, it, it all it's comes back how to they don't ever blame you as an individual. Yeah, and it it just blows my mind because I don't know if Americans could be that you know smart and discerning. Yeah, and, well, you know, I know the British could. Whacked us, would we just want to go after all the North Koreans? <laughs> yeah, no, it yeah. just blows my mind. I got the same. I get. I get it everywhere. I get it in Zimbabwe, Nicaragua. It doesn't matter. You know, uh, Laos. It doesn't matter. It's like you just go and they just they get it. But that that you're right. It's education. The, yeah. The fact that they have access to free education. Yeah. And um and Gaddafi and Assad. Yeah. Again, it's it's the interesting. Most interesting thing. It was all interesting what you said, but the most interesting thing to me is how they didn't identify themselves as Sunni, Shias, you know, Alawites. That's so important for people to understand because that's just, a, again, a, a sort of a construct of the Western media to justify colonialism. Yeah. Just like in Kenya, they want to privatize Kenya, so they say, oh, it's a tribal conflict between these two tribes. Rwanda, the, the Hutus and the Tutus are exact. the Hutus and the, the Tutsis and the Hutus are exactly same the same people. people. Yeah. There's no genetic difference. Yeah. It's just the Tutsis are the tall ones, and they were like, you, you be the butler, you're tall, so now we're going to call you a Tutsi. And that's all it was. And the Belgians did that to them, and they just divided them, and look what happened. Yeah. And now Rwandan people are waking up, though. After all that horrible stuff, they realize they were manipulated. They realize their history was usurped from them by these colonialists. And that's what happens all over Africa, all over Afghanistan, all over underdevelopment you see. It's not the people of these locales that are, oh, they're dumb, they're lazy. No, it's that they're being attacked. They're being attacked yeah. by the colonial masters every single day, man. If they get out of line, if they go socialist at all, if they want to get free education or a free shot to a kid or just a free house, imagine how much they hated Gaddafi. And then, of course, he went to the gold dinar, you know, and wanted to trade yeah. the gold dinar. And that was the death knell, just like it was for Saddam Hussein. But he was a hell of a guy. If you ever get a chance, or maybe you have, but read Gaddafi's. It's just called The Green Book. I've read it. Everyone's, yeah. yeah. You've read it. Nice. Yeah, we had it that published in, in 2011 on the website. It was on the original yeah. website that we had. Fantastic. Anarcho-syndicalist. Yeah. That's what he is. He's a self-proclaimed anarcho-syndicalist. How many people do you think know that? Or even know what that means? He's all <laughs> about direct it's democracy. And it's, it's kind of <laughs> decentralization of power. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is real power to people. Yes, yes, yeah. central. So you get together, but as I understand it, and you read the book, the people not only own the factories, but they decide what to make at the factories. Yeah. Yeah. What's our economy need? What do you people think? What yeah. should we do? 
There's that no boss and seven committees, and then everybody plays sports on weekends. There's no pro sports teams, but everybody plays football. Everybody plays soccer. Everybody yeah. plays rugby, basketball. Everybody, the whole it's just it's participatory. So that's that's the net. So that's the essence of socialism. On the other hand, Gaddafi really was uh, disseminating power. He never he never held power, held on to it, cling to it like the Western media would. You know, it's just totally the opposite. He's flamboyant, yeah. but that's it. Actually, yeah. a very quiet guy. And he's just like, you guys deal with this. I'll go live in my tent in the desert. And that's pretty much what he did. Yeah. He just dispersed power. He was, gave power away, which is what you do. It's just what you do in this exactly. world. You don't ever want to gather it. You want to disperse it. Once you yeah. get it, get rid of it. It's like, that's it. It's like oh, you don't want it. And so he, he knew that. He was smart enough to know that. And that's why his country, yeah, was just by far and away the richest African country. And also the best hope for Africa to have a pan-Africanist nationalist agenda because he was a leader of that. Now Africa needs another leader to emerge, uh, you know, that can – could sort of enunciate what he was talking about, which yeah. is to you know get Africa together as a continent, Pan Africanism, and they work together and forget about Britain and forget about the U.S. and forget about even China and Russia even. Yeah. And just let's just focus on our what we can do here, and that's what they really need. You know, an indigenous uh, you know approach to their economic development. And if they just decide, hey, like you said earlier, they only work eight hours a day, hundred gallons. Or uh, eight hours a week. I mean, it's hundreds of gallons. Why would they want to industrialize? And that's what they decide. Leave them alone. Yeah. <laughs> Leave them alone. Yeah. Good on them. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you ask me. I mean, we we in the West we call these countries developing, but but in actual fact, we are stopping them from from developing. We we yeah, are doing the exact developed. opposite. Yeah. Um, there's True. a there's a book out recently. I just finished reading uh, called The Divide by Jason Hickel, and he says for every one dollar of aid that goes to developing countries. $26 comes back the other way. And that is obviously money for the paying, servicing debt, uh, but it's also paying for drugs and, and stuff that's patented in the West. This is why people like um, uh, Bill Gates, he's, he's really big on sort of intellectual property, but this is costing African lives, that, that they can't afford AIDS medicine and stuff like that. So, so uh -huh. they, they pay a fortune back to the West, and it's... It's always seen that we're yeah. do, we're the charitable ones, we're we're the benevolent, and we're making we're helping them out. But we're doing the exact opposite. Exact opposite, and that's like the that's the cover. That's the cover. See, there has to be a cover for all the nefarious things we're doing behind the scenes. So they, they do the aid agencies as a cover, but not just a cover. They actually go in there. They do ma manipulate things, and they try to boost up uh, right wing kind of neoliberal parties that are for free trade and for mm. you know helping Pepsi Cola, you know, instead of helping. Yeah. The kid down the street, you know, doesn't even get a bowl of rice every day, and they elevate those people within those eight local aid organizations, and then they start parties, and you know, the Orange Revolution and the Cedar Revolution and the Rose Revolution, and all these fake revolutions that they, you know, that's how they do it. They do it with NGOs, you know. Yeah. So it's not just a cover; it's actually an intelligence. You have to see aid agencies as also an intelligence asset. That's what they really are nowadays. It's really sad that it's that way, but it is that way. I, I think the, the NGOs have, have really come into their own in the last, certainly in the last 10, 15 years. Um, in, in Syria, the apex of this, what, what people call like the NGO military complex, it's all kind of tied in together. But the apex of, of the NGO complex in Syria is the White Helmets. I don't know if you've read much about these guys, but they, they claim to be Syria's civil defense. But Syria has had a civil defense unit or a department uh, for about 60 years now, since the 1950s, and they're registered with the, the international organization, they're recognized by the UN. This new crowd, they were trained by a British mercenary in Turkey, uh, funded by the West, mostly funded by the UK, but I think they've had like 200 million from the UK Foreign uh, Office, and uh, it was the USAID in America. Um, there you go. And, and, USAID, yeah. They're and crooked. they're yeah. only based in um, terrorist held areas. They're not really civil defense. They're not helping out the civilians. A lot of their filming, I mean, they've, they've won an Oscar, for Christ's sake. Yeah. But a lot of their Did films, they? have, have, um, they're just kind of like staged. And, and they're, pulling staged. People, they're yeah. pulling people out of rubble. And rather than worry about neck injuries or back injuries, they just toss them over their shoulder and run off down the road yeah. with them. But manage to get it all on HD camera, you know? Yeah, and they're probably the ones there when Assad bombs a place where... You know, ISIS knew they were going to bomb, so then they moved chemical weapons in there. ISIS does, CIA does, and then you know, after he bombs it, they say, "Oh, Assad, bomb, you know, bomb yeah. chemical weapons." And they're probably the ones there taking the pictures. I'm thinking these white helmets. Yeah, the most intelligence asset. <coughs> I'm pretty sure. Very interesting about the London connections. I'm pretty sure that's British intelligence right there. 
Well, the, the guy you know, that's good stuff they do. They do. They do some weird stuff. Yeah. I mean, they, they really try to fool you, and um, they're good at it. They, I'll give them credit. Yeah, they're really good at fooling people. Like, anytime you hear like some heart heartstring tugging thing about something, just beware, of people, because it's usually some propaganda. Yeah, behind it and some reason. Just like they were, you know, ooh about the Kurds, you know, right before that referendum, the poor Kurds. And in fact, the Kurds have like twice the standard of living of anybody else in Iraq. Yeah, yeah. And this is what I worry about is see, the Kurds have been used for forever by the CIA and almost uh, and always let down. His father was Mustafa Brazan. He was totally, you read the book, he was totally used by the CIA to uh, invade for the Shah of Iran into Iraq to mm-hmm. destabilize the left wing Al Bakr government, Al Qasim government, communist governments, you know. Same guy Saddam was targeting. He worked for the CIA in 65. Bruce O'Dell was his handler, I can name his handler, it's in the book. And, and he worked for the CIA, and then, you know, he killed leftists, and he killed Shia, Shia who are mostly leftists, communists, you know, whoever, union people, um, just anybody who was radical. And then, of course, Saddam, uh, you know, he, he got into the U.S.-Iraqi business for him in 88, he started to see what they were doing, they were going to privatize all their farm, and, they were gonna, and the people of Iraq swayed him because they're still really leftists. And so Saddam took a left turn and started actually doing some good things, and that's when he killed him, of course. And just like Noriega, when Noriega said, "I'm not going to, I'm not going to haul this shit for the Contras anymore. Either way, drugs or weapons, it's wrong. I'm not going to do it." He kind of was cozy with the sand. He says a little bit actually. That's when they took Noriega out. Oh, he's a drug trafficker. Let's put him in prison. Yeah. You know, and that's how they do it. So if you go the wrong way, it doesn't matter when. You know, so you might as well just go the right way the whole time because they're going to target you. Again. So I'm, I'm guessing you read um, what's the economic hitman, the Confessions of an Economic Hitman. You know, I've never actually read it. I know it's kind of all the rage, and I need to, but I kind of get the idea. Yeah, and, we, we know I mean, what happens. They, they they go in and they try and bribe, coerce the government. So it might be a genuine yeah. leftist leader, but they'll try and bribe him, and if he's not taking the bribe, they'll send in the jackals to do a little assassination. If that doesn't work, which didn't work with Saddam, then they just send in the army. They send in the military. So there's a few phases yeah. that they try and go through, and if yeah. the leader's not corruptible, then they just yeah. take them out. Yeah, the less blood, the better, because it's just attention. Mm. You always take the chance; somebody will find out. And so, yeah, you know that. And, and right now, that's what worries me about you know computers. Frankly, is it's creating this kind of uh, even though there's guys like us and gals you know talking about this. Generally speaking, that like especially the social media like Facebook, it creates this kind of hive mentality on things. At least, like, and there's one side and there's other side, and that's it. You know, yeah. <laughs> and they're back and forth at each other, being antagonistic, and. Um, just trying to break communication, not trying to be social, actually trying to be antisocial. So it's, I call it antisocial media, you know, like Facebook. Yeah. It's antisocial media. You know, I got friends that don't even call me anymore because they just text and they tweet and they just whatever useless crap <laughs> to everybody every day, all the time. Who cares, you know? And it's yeah. just, it's really... Uh, Atomized. I don't even know where I was going with that, but I worry that that's going to take us the other way in terms of uh, well, a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, well, but, we're, uh, we're trying to, we certainly support... All the grassroots groups that we can in the UK, There was we went to a meeting last week called Media on Trial. I'll send you the links to it because it's all now yep. up on YouTube somewhere. But these are people that have either a couple of academics and, and journalists that, have, that we love that have been to Syria come back and report these voices that we just don't hear in, on the BBC or on Fox or What's CNN up? or whatever. Um, so so it, it does happen. It's very small groups, but what do we get? 550 yeah. people yeah. Tur- turned up in a meeting last, last week. Which is fantastic, you know, yeah. uh, all, all wanting to hear those voices that they wouldn't have heard yeah. anywhere else on the mainstream media. It's important. It's important. I, I did the same thing. I've done a couple, you know, back from Nicaragua, back from, you know, I did the same thing. I show slideshows and I go to public libraries and I kind of just try to explain. Of course, that was back in the day, no internet. But yeah, you have to bring those voices back. That's part of your responsibility as a Brit or as an American myself yeah. is to, to go there to learn. And, and then to bring back that information because, again, you know, the mainstream media, we know who controls it. It's just, it's Illuminati control, same bankers, same kings and queens. They control the media and never more than before, never never more than that. Mm. I mean, even the Robert Barron era of the 1890s, I don't believe the media was necessarily controlled. I know it wasn't. You know, in America, you had a lot of muckraking newspapers that would just tell like it is still. Yeah. And this is where the hive mentality comes in. It's like it's all being narrowed down to cartels. One company will control banking, one in insurance. Pretty soon it'll be just one company. And then our minds are being narrowed down. I guess where I was trying to go with the other thing was, you know, rather than the bloodshed, rather than having to whack somebody like the jackals and, and Perkins book do, the, the, the best way for them is to sedate us on the Internet, to keep us, like, plugged into this electronic matrix and not really out in the streets talking to our neighbors or with guns and rifles in their mouths at all. 
we're just thinking we're getting stuff done and maybe we're not getting as much done as, as no, it's all important. Like what you're doing, I can see what, well, I use it too. I'm just saying it's important that we all stay grounded. Uh, because I know that's what they're after is they're after the self censorship. Yeah. Well, there's levels, there's the jackals, there's the military behind that. There's psychological warfare behind that. There's censorship behind that. There's self censorship. Which is going to be worse. Go in mind to think that I can't say that because nobody will, you know, I'm going to be ostracized by all the people out there on Facebook or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, then they got us. That's the silent prison. That's when you become your own jailer. And that's scary. And that's what I fear. You know, it could be coming, but yeah. we just have to keep shaking the cage too. And maybe we'll help. Maybe it won't come. You know, you talk about self-censorship and, and, and why some people won't speak out on this. And uh, just before we started the interview, I was, I was showing Ali, um, it was an interview with you and a guy, I think his name was Kaplan, big fat guy in San Francisco. He was on a press TV and he was Maybe basically, so. just because you mentioned bankers, he mentioned the word anti-Semite and he mentioned the yeah. word Jews and it's a slur to shut down the conversation. And, yes. and it's happening here in the, in the Labour Party in the UK. There's this there's scandals, but there's nothing behind it, you know. Um, yeah. And again, it's just yeah, a, it's just a silent weapon. It's, it's a phrase that's used and thrown about. As, and yep. you toss it at somebody, and if it sticks, that's it. Their reputation is tarnished, and no one that's hears right. them again. And, and right. people self censor because they don't want to be labeled right. in that way, you know. And it's just that's ridiculous. Right. We have to be strong enough and, and brave enough to at least speak out on these things, especially yeah, when there's a ton that. of evidence behind you're it. Gonna, and you're going to take heat, you know, if you're on the right side right now, because things are so messed up, so messed up in the West. That if, you, if you're on the right side, if you're trying to really get change, you're going to take heat. That's just the way it is. Yeah. I mean, we got, you know, because the lie is that big, because truth has been just totally thrown under the bus. Truth does not exist in the media world out there for the most part. You know, this little thing right here and some little thing yeah. over here. Otherwise, it's the biggest lie you can imagine, and it gets bigger. And so uh, we just have to stay strong. I was, you know, it's like William Shakespeare, you know, like be, be true to that, to that own self, be true. You know, Shakespeare was the one guy, you know, Leary, Timothy Leary, and those guys, they tripped acid, and they'd read all these books and listen to music, and, you know, which ones can we, we'll just, you know, like, we, you know, we can't see through them, you know, because, they say, oh, this guy, he said it because it was self grandizing or something. With Shakespeare, they could never see through any of his stuff. It was so pure. He got acid, and there, I was back to a band where I grew up called Trip Shakespeare, <laughs> and that's what it meant, you know, because yeah. they couldn't trip Shakespeare. They couldn't yeah. do it. Because he was so real, and who knows who the guy was? You know, we don't even know. But yeah, no one knows. Really, and that one especially, to thine own self be true. Yeah, you know that's so important. So important right now. Just stay grounded. You know, don't Dean, go with the crowd. Don't pick a side. Dean, we've been going for about fifty minutes or so. I think yeah. there's a couple of little points that I, I definitely want to get your take on. Um, I'll, I'll bring this one up first. I, do you know Bill Engdahl? F. William Engdahl? Yes, yes, Okay, so yes. this is something that my mind is, is just blown away, and I'm not quite sure what's, what's true about this. So the jury's still out for me, and I'm still doing research on it. But fairly recently, I think in the last couple of years, he's now talking about oil as not fossil fuel, but as some kind of renewable uh, energy source that's produced in a, some kind of chemical reaction in the mantle of the earth and close to the core uh, and he says he's basically saying that it's not it's not created from you know dinosaur to try uh, sixty five million years true. ago. Interesting. Now, now I mean, I don't know. I, I do wonder, really, honestly, I do wonder. Um, there's so many lies, and of course, the peak oil thing. That's that where it's coming from. Yeah, lie, and that was just uh, oil companies wanting to get four fifty a gallon in the case of the U.S., which you know it's at two dollars a gallon now, and it always has been since I was I've been in this world and then for a little while when peak oil was going up all of a sudden it's 450 a gallon yeah. and that's all that was it was just a lie I don't believe in peak oil I know that um, so I don't know I, I wouldn't count I wouldn't I don't know I've never you know drilled underground with a drill and had access to that kind of it's just thing about oil it takes capital to get yeah. to it right yeah. and this is the key for these elites they know that any working schmuck can't just go out and buy a drill rig for 100 grand or whatever you know, can't go buy at least the land. Can't, can't, can't. And a lot of capital it takes a lot of capital. Yeah. Solar panel, wind, wind turbines. No, not true. Nice and cheap. It's all a lot of labor. It creates jobs. Yeah. Actually, there's no jobs in the oil industry. <laughs> there's not. It's so yeah. capital intensive. Yeah. That there's no jobs either. There's, so mach there's machinery you and profit. Snap to get rid of it. Yeah, because it's obviously not natural what it does in the. So that doesn't matter that part. Like whether it's from there or there. Mm. I mean, we still got to phase it out. Okay. Yeah. But it is interesting, Engdahl, and, and I know Bill. He's a good guy. He's got integrity. Uh, early on, when I first wrote the first edition of Big Oil, which is, gosh, 
in 2005. And Bill and I exchanged books, and I got his Seeds of Destruction about Monsanto, which everybody should read. Yeah. And it's got my big role. And I think he, he took a lot from it. And then later on, they, it was him uh, that got my book published in Germany, The Federal Reserve Cartel in German Language, okay. before I even put it out here. Wow. And he was working at that uh, that bunch. And so he's a good guy. Yeah. He's really smart. And he might be onto something. Yeah. Who knows? I don't know yet. Um, I don't either. The, the other thing, very, very briefly again, is just because it's the anniversary and we've got – MPs in London they are going to be going celebrating this thing, Balfour Declaration, Centenary this year. Um, now, from what I can gather, the uh, this this declaration was written by uh, Balfour, who was some kind of diplomat or, or politician. He addressed it to the Rothschild family, uh, and yeah. it was basically he was promising land that we didn't own to another group of people that didn't even live there. Um, and there were some pre precursors to it, like you you cannot um, affect the rights of the Arab population that already lives there. That that's the whole thing has gone out of the window. So what can we celebrate, you know, or even commemorate? Yeah, what we celebrate is right because that that provision certainly was not met. And yeah, Bal Al Alfred Balfour was his name, and he was uh, or Arthur. I'm sorry, Arthur, Arthur Balfour. Balfour that's that's it. It. He was a member of the Business Roundtable, and that was a very that's a very significant group that everyone should study. It was in existence in the 1910s and teens uh, in uh, Great Britain. It was all around Chatham House. And uh, yeah, that's where the BBC came out of. That's where the Royal Institute of International Affairs came out of, which also gave birth to the Council on Foreign Relations and a bunch of similar organizations in other countries, Australia, Canada, Germany, France. Um, that's where uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, I'm pretty sure, was hatched. That's where, uh, you know, right after the Federal Reserve had been formed. Anyway, the Business Roundtables, their, their mission was to, and John Coleman talks about this in his Committee of 300 book, send, out, send people out to colonize the world, basically run things in certain areas. So the Rockefellers and the Krulovs kind of came over here. The Warburgs kind of got Germany and Eastern Europe and the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, you know, Cecil Rhodes, the Oppenheimers, and the Ralph Giles themselves went to Southern Africa because um, that was the richest place. And of course, the Rothschilds went there. Anglo-American is this giant tentacle, which includes De Beers, the biggest diamond producer, and Englehart, the biggest gold refiner. Anglo-American is just like an empire unto itself. Mm. And um, anyway, they, they did that, and they put out the Balfour Declaration, creating Israel, which, again, Israel is just working for the city of London. There's your proof. There's your evidence. There's yeah. your paperwork. Um, they created it. And... Why? Because they need something in the Middle East, an entity, to keep the Arabs divided. Now, I want to go back to the unity I'm seeing now, because it's important. Kurdistan, they had the referendum. Um, it was all smoke and smoke and, and mirrors designed to steal oil from Kirkuk Oilfield, give it to ExxonMobil. I've been negotiating on it. El, El Malaki dissed them. El Abadi dissed them. Um, Iraq is dissing them. They won't give them the share they want. Saying that's our all you can get maybe a little bit if you want to pump it, but you're not gonna give you sixty percent, sorry. So now that ISIS is defeated, here's what we gotta watch for the Peshmerga. Because <laughs> they've trained up the Peshmerga now, the Kurds, and that's Barzani's people, the Kurdish Democratic Party mainly. And they're now in, going into Syria and ISIS vacates, US bombs, indiscriminately killing, you know, thousands of civilians, and then Peshmerga takes over. So are they now gonna use the Peshmerga just like they used ISIS? See, to do the oil smuggling out yeah. of Kirkuk, which they've been doing. That's been one of the main reasons for ISIS, oil smuggling from Kirkuk oil field. Yeah. Going I mean, to the oil those, beaches for nothing. Those roads of tankers, they were like they were like a, a, a pipeline. They were just roads of... Syria. Yeah. I mean, they, and they were they were heading out to, uh, to Turkey. And it Turkey. was actually the Turkish really president's son that was, that was putting that back onto the black market, all that stolen oil. There you, go. there you go. That's what, exactly what they're doing. And then the drugs are coming in from the Golden Crescent through that border. And, and the arms coming in region. from Bulgaria as well on diplomatic flights. Um, hey, hey, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, I think Ukraine was playing that role until yeah. the recent, I don't know, maybe still are, though, Poroshenko. Yeah, it's all like that. It's crazy stuff. And um, But I just, uh, yeah, people, I guess like, like you said, Mike, you know, you went to Syria, it was the same blueprint as Libya. That's what people, you know, need to understand about current affairs. Look, if something happened like in Nicaragua that we've been talking about, or in Syria that we've been talking about, just really touching on, you can count on the next thing that happens when they say it's just like that. It'll be just the same lie they told you last time. Yeah. 
You know, Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. Remember that one? Yeah. Okay, now Assad's gassing his own people. I see. So you just got to know that's a lie instantly and then seek out the truth, which is that Assad is a pretty darn good leader and he wants to unify the country, not divide them along sectarian lines. And that's yeah. all chatter from the CIA and British intelligence yeah. to divide the Syrian people. And they're going to use that same chatter on us to be racist against black people or to, I don't know, hate the certain some sect or some sector. You know, it's just all hate. It's all unity is what we need. Unity. Well, exactly. Well, That's well, right. well, we're fighting with one another. We're not looking at the big picture. We're not looking at the true enemy. Yeah. There you go. That's yeah. what we got to quit doing, man. It's yeah, a waste yeah. of time. Keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the head of the snake, and let's slap that sucker off. And if I know we're getting closer, but if people want to subscribe to my site, just so they know, you can do it for free. Uh, I'm not in this for the money, dude. I'm in this for the revolution. Okay, so this it's Henderson Left Hook. Dot WordPress dot com and uh, you can get to all my articles there. I write one once a week, and uh, last one was about this Kenyan election and history of that. So, thanks for having me, Mike. Dean, thank and you I, so much. Thank you, Dean. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, and and you guys have a great day. And uh, well, send me a link, I guess. So uh, yeah, we'll yeah. we'll pub we'll publish yeah, this, but we'll, we'll send you the link to the the video before we publish it. We probably won't edit it because it's. It's flown really well. I'm really happy. Seems fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, we'll yeah, send you the link and it'll be, it'll be sent to you in the next couple of days. But as I say, it'll be unedited, so we'll, we'll see how it goes up and, and let people uh, make their own okay. minds up. But right. Dean, this has well, been an I like absolute guys, pleasure. My like good people, and I'd like to meet you someday, and maybe we will. Yeah. But until then, until the revolution, okay? <laughs> okay, man. <laughs>